Okay, I think we are good. Um, so good morning, the people on this, and I think all the panelists have powers. If I haven't given powers, just let me know. Um, good morning, the people on this side of the ocean, and good evening, the people back home. Um, welcome to yet another discussion. Today we are going to tackle the issue of retirement, so everything about it. And as usual, we, uh, we always have an opening statement from my fake co-panelist, Saya. So Saya, you're up. Go ahead. Okay. Um, first of all, we need to start by saying happy, happy Father's Day to all the fathers and the father figures here. Um, you celebrated. Uh, my favorite quote for the day is a man yeah. is not a man because of what he has, but a man is a man because of whose he is. All power to you, men out there, and all power to you, um, fathers. Um, a second favorite quote is a woman may carry a pregnancy for nine months, but a man is always a true father, is always expectant with the endeavors the expectations and the inquiries of his family. So all grace and strength to you men as you carry the never relieved um, pregnancy of being a father, all power to you. So currently we are going through um, what some people have described as the largest um, experiment whose endpoint we don't know. It's called the digital um, transformation. There's never been any time in history when um, new technology whose end ramification has been unleashed on people without prior knowledge of what it will turn out to, like we have now. We don't know the full extent of what computers and computing will do to our brains and to our socialization and to our culture. but we're just running on, we are, we are part of it. And the reality is it's only years down the road, years, years down the road, that we will only be able to look back and say, okay, it turned out well, or this didn't turn out so well. The reason I begin with the digital um, revolution we're living through is because today's topic is really made possible because of the effects of previous revolutions and specifically two previous revolutions. One is the agrarian revolution and the second one is the industrial revolution. Let me explain myself a bit better here. The, um, before the industrial revolution, the idea of leaving home and going to work for somebody was completely foreign. Therefore, even the idea of retirement, which means you have come to the end of productive or what people would call productive years of employment, was, a, was completely strange to most people because we speak to a dominantly African and African diaspora um, context. In the African context, the, the word retirement did not exist. What just happened is the older you grew, your role, your duty, and your place in society changed. Um, and of course, eventually when you died, we believed you joined the ancestors. But there was never this point where you were either viewed as not needed or not productive enough or there was no payment. But then comes in the first, the agrarian revolution, which allows us to um, produce more food. And then shortly after that comes the industrial revolution that removes people from livelihoods off their farms and places them in factories and takes them far away from the rural places and begins putting them in the cities and where they then spend 30, 40 years of their prime. And when they're done, they are then shipped back to the mostly in African settings, their rural places, which for many, for many people at that point, they have lost attachment because they have spent the better part of three or four decades away in the city. And then came now, comes now this all manner of problems that we associate with retirement. This, I hope we, I hope to have said we have found a way to mitigate, but as we have said in previous sessions, the challenge still stands true is because the 
African as a person finds himself having to transition between um, two systems and the transition has never been full and complete. In somewhere within our DNA and the DNA of our culture, the DNA of our socialization, we are still what we were prior to the industrial revolution and prior to what we were before colonialism. But then the habitus where we inhabit in our everyday reality is informed by the industrial revolution, the agrarian revolution, and now the digital revolution. And therefore the African individual, male or female, finds themselves operating unconsciously with pre-industrial age expectations while functioning in a post-industrial age um, reality. And what that looks like is before the industrial age, the community took care of their old, the children or the people who took care of their father and their mother, and it was expected. And they did not lose relevance because they were sought for counsel and sought for wisdom. And so a lot of people still have that kind of expectation. And then lo and behold, they retire to the village. For starters, they have not been very physically active. They've probably been pushing papers at desk or doing blue collar jobs, and therefore their physical state is not tip top. And then secondly, they have been um, disconnected from community. And when they return, the ideas they have are very urban and cannot probably function in this new setting. And what's more, people are looking for the next younger, sharper, brighter person to be able to look for. And so many of the old people end up finding themselves lonely as they are pushed aside in what seems to be a bubble of irrelevance. And then what's more, their peers, their age mates are either by this time either dead or alienated. And as old people keep living within particular um, enclaves in their rural places, individuals who are initially connected in an office setting find themselves now secluded somewhere in a rural place, or even if in the urban setting, they're not as mobile and not as needed as they used to be. And as an end result, the one person said when an old person dies in the African setting, it's synonymous with an entire library burning down because when they go down, a whole trove of information, a whole trove of history and experience has gone down with them. And because we're not really managing our retirements well, many old people are reaching there when they are broke or broken physically, emotionally, and otherwise. What's more, the children in whom they had invested as their retirement package are not able to fully come through because the economy, our unemployment, and the children have to restart their own lives. And all those realities mean that by the time they're coming to their old age, these men and women who have worked so hard find themselves trapped. In the words of the Bible, it says, if you have run with a footman and they have wearied you, what will you do when the horsemen show up? And so many of our old people or yet to retire people are finding themselves worn out by the realities of the industrial age and the, in the realities of the digital age. And then there's waiting this horseman called retirement. So today we need to have an authentic discussion. And it's not just for dealing with individuals already in retirement. It's for also individuals looking forward to retirement. But one step even backward, it is this anticipation of retirement that is probably influencing or affecting a lot of behavior in the workplace. I dare even say what we imagine often to be multi or intergenerational conflict has nothing to do with differences in generation, but has more to do with the anticipation of retirement. And therefore some people trying to kick down the road, the reality of retirement end up being gatekeepers of the workplace or some individuals viewing those closer to retirement as being old and not needed and are jostling for their positions or elbowing their ideas and their person out. So it isn't just down the road at retirement that these problems begin affecting us. It's backfilling. It is um, coming all the way back to the time of work and of life. So we need to have an authentic dialogue. We need to talk about the four horsemen of retirement. Back to you, Paul. Um, thank you. Thank you very much, Saya. So since Shalom has been here before, <laughs> we will start with you. 
Um, I want us to just uh, understand the situation on the ground, especially um, as pertains our people, because uh, Sarah and I are not in the continent at the moment, as pertains our people back home. What is, the, um, uh, from, your, uh, from your eyes, what are you seeing? What is happening to our people as they retire? What, and just remind me what's the retirement age right now in Kenya? Okay, I'm not even sure what the official retirement age is because more and more we are leaving the areas that had to have a retirement age. You know, so retirement age, I think, is more in the civil service, those working for governments and such like places. And it's anything between 50 to 55. And then I know there are some organizations that have 60, so I'm not sure what the actual age is at the moment. But 50 used to be taken to be the, now by 50, you need to start thinking about retirement. But unfortunately, what's happening on the ground is that people are, they're not growing old as, as fast as they used to grow old. You know, they're not as worn out. And therefore there's lots of people feeling, but I'm still young. I still have so much to offer, you know? And then it is coupled with the fact that, um, Organizations are not yet ready to hire who they call the millennials and the younger generation. So they still, we have people holding onto the oldies and the oldies not knowing where to go. So there is hesitation to retire. But one of the worrisome things that I faced in terms of, um, as far as my work and interaction with clients was concerned, was people reaching that age of about 60 and they're worried that they can't stop working because who will take care of my children? And the children, when you check what the children they're talking about, these are young adults. So they have raised dependents who are not able to, they don't have their own jobs. They don't live in their own homes. And so they're wondering, okay, I'm nearing 60. Who's going to take care of my 25 year old? Yeah, so there's a lot of uh, stress. You know, as I was saying, the anticipation of retirement is a whole lot more stressful than even retirement itself. And then the other thing that we're finding is that when, because of this anticipation, people nearing retirement age are grasping at anything that they can grab and therefore ending up doing, um, starting businesses and sinking all their benefits, sinking their hard earned savings. I'm not an expert on finances, but I'm finding them stressed that I put all my money in this thing and then it failed. They had no business knowledge, nothing, prior to that, but somebody gave them a good idea and told them, you know, you're retiring, you still have energy, start a hardware shop. You know, you're retired, you're retiring, yeah, you're going to have this nice golden handshake, start this. So they're seeking advice from people who are not even successful business people themselves. And so lots of, you know, even when you're talking about the poverty being one of the horsemen, lots of people are getting into this space uh, destitute due to decisions that they've made that they had not prepared themselves for. Yeah. Okay, thank you. And um, Robina, what are you, because uh, you can introduce yourself to us because you're new to uh, um, to this space. What are you seeing on the ground? What, what The same question I asked um, Shalom. What's the situation in your ground? Uh, thanks for having me. My name is Robina Oyaro. I'm a medical of um, medical practitioner. I'm a consultant physician and um, preventive cardiovascular medicine specialist. Um, I'm also a lecturer. Now, um, in medical field, what I am seeing and what is really worrying is most people don't prepare for. Um, the the bodies then that come with old age like people um think they'll be young forever so they don't um take the necessary precautions right from the time they are young so that is they they don't eat well exercise enough if they have these um, lifestyle diseases or whatever kind of illnesses they do not then go for regular to prevent complications in the future. So what I'm seeing is when these uh, illnesses catch up with the older people, they were not prepared for that. 
So then it's the, the children who are stepping in to come and they probably stop their work. Let me give an example. Someone gets hypertension, doesn't really follow up uh, on doctor's appointments to prevent the complications, then they get something like a stroke. Then the child now needs to stop working wherever they were to come and take care of the father or whoever it is who's gotten the stroke. So that means um, the father or the parent didn't uh, put the necessary maybe medical insurance for such an occurrence the son now needs to, or the daughter has stopped working to come and do um, and take care of the parent. And then now this child probably has children who won't get the financial, uh, their financial needs met. So it's actually a bad um, roller coaster, if I may say so. So I'm seeing a lot of people who've retired in the medical, not, not just medics, but people who've retired who didn't plan financially or um, otherwise for retirement or the bodies that they'll get in retirement in terms of the illnesses that will come, in terms of what those illnesses mean, the complications, who will take care of them. And it just causes a bad uh, sort of snowball effect on their children and the families there. Uh, um, Okay, thank you. Um, let me go to to Patrick, um, because you're the one the one planning our finances. Um, Patrick, um, what is the same question? What is the situation on, on the ground? What are you having to deal with um, in terms of retirement? Um, I think um, one like the uh, first speaker mentioned, retirement is. Uh, uh, two levels here. Yeah. Civil servants have a clear age of 60 and it's likely to extend to 65 um, following some developments elsewhere in the global space. The other companies in the private sector are largely at 55 with 50 an assured age for early retirement. 50 is recognized as a, an early retirement age. KRA recognizes you to be retired at 65 for tax purposes. Um, they give you zero tax on all your payments after you've hit 65. Uh, so that although the government recognizes 60, you will be taxed, your, your emolument will be taxed um, just the same way someone living at 55 or 50 would be taxed. In terms of the realities on the ground, I think the whole essence of um, retirement planning uh, from a point of view of training people is a very recent development, uh, perhaps 20 years, and uh, has been getting better as we head into 2023, meaning in the earlier years, not many companies had a, a proper program for preparing people. I've been training retirement planning for the last 14 years. Um, at the central bank, for example, they start preparing their employees as early as 45 years in terms of um, what they call alternative income and that has to do with the historical uh, prospects of the country. Remember, in 1990s, following the structural adjustment programs, organizations like POSTA, Telecom, a lot of those government uh, institutions that had to go through a retrenchment um, lost a lot of people who are retrenched. They didn't take long, they died. Uh, shortly after they had been given a lot of money. So that um, in the year 2000 and beyond, there has been a very deliberate effort to try and uh, prepare employees for retirement. The challenge still remains that it comes a little too late because retirement does not, retirement planning is not something you go into um, because you have money. 
is something you go into because you have to have to prepare in your mind. I quit employment at 40 exactly. And, and the idea of retirement is not starting for me now. It's something that has been in my mind for the last 40 years. I mean, since I was 40, it's more of an idea of how I do it. And I think there's a difference between mental preparedness and pocket preparedness. Um, it is it is it's going to be very dangerous to give someone a lot of money in their hands when they are not mentally prepared, as I will explain briefly. So from a mental preparedness uh, point of view, it is now a deliberative program from insurance companies. I've known Minette, I've known Alexander Forbes, I've known those pension fund related companies have been actually offering training uh, to their clients for quite a while. Now, there are still a lot of other companies that don't offer any form of retirement planning. And if they offer you anything, it is just to meet the law. They do a two hour quick training. It is not, it is about the psychological. In fact, the bigger issue with retirement is not the money, it is a psychological transition. Um, um, uh, what the Dakota said that uh, 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 just a few minutes ago, uh, that you are not prepared for the kind of body you'll be in uh, in a few in a few years, and and it's not just a physical body; it's about more of the that uh, that psychological transition is it is beginning to be very common, but the kind of programs offered are very thin and more of a appearance to have met the law that you have trained people before they got retired. In real sense, the programs ought to be very detailed. A good one takes about five days. And I can tell you about only four companies on the can on the on this country called Kenya uh, have those kind of programs that prepare retirees for five days. Uh, the rest give you uh, what you can do in five days in a day. You pack it in your mind. You work out with it. I think I I have seen that quite often. I'm called more for two hours than I'm called for five days. So on the ground, you would say, yes, uh, there's a, an appreciation of the difficulties that people go through post-retirement, but the responses are inadequate. In terms of are the people retiring when they are ready financially and otherwise, if you ask me, they are not. A lot of people get that one third of their pension and they don't know exactly what to do. One, because a lot of us think business is easy. Um, it's something we don't try to learn when we are younger, when you're still 40, when you have the energy to hit, hit and miss. So by the time someone is hitting 55, tending towards 60, and then they have the money in their hand, is when they realize that they neither have the energy nor the mental preparedness for entrepreneurship. And like uh, Shalom said, there are lots of losses. It's a fact. There are a lot of losses because people are not prepared uh, to go through that learning curve of, of, of that business requires. Um, they are not good investors. They were not good investors. You don't become a master investor in the day you retire. You need a lot of exposure to the investment environment to now master these small things. So when you now have big money later, it is easier to make good decisions. A lot of people retire when they don't have the correct level of investment skills, including knowing that they should carry assets that are less volatile. Now I'll give you an example. Uh, in 2008, I left the bank a commercial bank to join an investment bank. That time the problem was the post-election violence. So the stock exchange had dropped from 5,000 to around 2,800. Generally, everybody's asset values collapsed by 50%. It took about six months for this to come back. Most retirees were exposed in wrong shares because the environment called Kenya does not have the right number of financial advisors. So people are pushed into 
acquiring wrong assets because everything has been had been upward. Uh, shares were doing well, literally of any company. So we were in a place where people had all sorts of shares. You find a retiree holding a Safaricom share and it has collapsed. First of all, a retiree should not hold that kind of share because it's not paying dividends. Two, you're not there for capital gain. That was not right. So when that ended, the meltdown came in in September. June, it ended the effect of the, the post-election violence. September, we had now the meltdown, the, uh, the, the mortgage meltdown global problem, taking back the entire NSC back. And I witnessed a, a 71 year old professor make a decision to lose 18 million out of 40 because he could no longer pay it. Why? The money was sitting in US funds. You know what I mean? Meltdown no hardware at the epicenter was in the US. And, and really, he didn't, need to, he didn't need to take away the money. But just because of the lack of the understanding how the stock market works, he could not be advised. And so I have witnessed a scenario where, regardless of the level of education, people are ignorant about wealth and how to sustain it. And, 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 and people are confused being in business with being financially stable. Because a business can go down anytime. I've lost my business here. I built a business for 11 years and I lost it during COVID completely. So uh, I've understood how a business can disappear uh, <laughs> between the time you go to bed and wake up in the morning and you went to bed when you're financially very stable. So the question of the understanding of retirement, its implication in terms of health, its implication in terms of financial stability, its requirement on you to be knowledgeable in terms of investment and entrepreneurship, which are completely different animals, is significantly low and need to be enhanced. Thank you. Thank you, Patrick. So we go to Paul, because you're our HR here at the back, really, really in Kenya stops with you because most retire the people who are retiring are coming from your hands. So uh, let's start with what the, what the situation is on the ground, and then you will be the first person to tackle the first horseman, which is poverty. Uh, I think... Uh... To be honest, the situation on the ground is, let me look at it in two ways. Those who are still in the workplace and those who have left. Um, for those who have left, our retirement landscape is littered with uh, dependency, denial, bitterness. People are forced to work when they're not able to work because they don't have income. And uh, all sorts of indecencies that a human being can be subjected to in their own lives, in their old lives. And when you track that back to the uh, retirement benefits landscape, I, I want just to share with you some of the statistics that we have. In Kenya, we have about, um, our workforce about 28 million, of which uh, the formerly employed are about 18 million. But when you look at uh, those who are members of any particular scheme, there are only 7 million. And being a member of a scheme does not mean that you are, not, you are saving enough for your retirement, or rather you are preparing yourself well. Uh, the recent statistics shared by regulators show that the pension coverage is only at 25% of the workforce. And uh, when you look at those who have retired, there is what we call the income replacement rate. It is recommended that for you to live a good standard of life financially, you should have somewhere anything between 50% to 70% replacement ratio. But when you look at uh, our circumstance is that many people are below 20%. They just, let's say it's around 20%, which means they have very little money to live on. And those are those, the ones who are happy to be in a pension scheme 
for those who do not have, maybe some are paid gratuity in cash, little money, spend over a short period of time, like uh, Patrick says, uh, unwise business decisions. And uh, within a short period, they're completely uh, dependent. The, the, the irony is that now they don't have anybody to, to depend on because the social structures that were there before that could take care of old people are collapsing. And uh, they find life very difficult. And that's where you see them going back to work, sometimes having to do indecent jobs in order to, to, act, to act a living. So when you come to the, to the workplace, that is where the preparation for retirement is supposed to start. And as Patrick rightly says, it's supposed to start as early as possible. He says at 45, but for me, I say it's supposed to start immediately at the beginning of employment. For those who have pension schemes, for instance, we know very well that if we are to give employees an option to join or not to join, many of the employees will not uh, will not join because of the levels of financial literacy. We have a situation that is characterized by two, uh, let me say it is, it is a conundrum. I mean, people, people overestimate, underestimate their needs in retirement on one hand. They think that they'll not need so much. On the other hand, they overestimate their capacity to deal with issues that will come up during retirement. So when it starts, they find that it is, it is, it is, it is completely different from what they expected. The total life will be easy. They won't need as much money, but they find that, that their needs continue irrespective of whether they have retired or not. There's a theory, an economic theory, I think uh, some, some, some of us will have heard about, it's called the life cycle hypothesis. The life cycle hypothesis tells us that rational human beings are supposed to spend what they have earned during their productive times and save enough for those times that they'll not be productive. But you find that the opposite is what happens. And when you look up uh, about this, the, the question of how much are they supposed to save, it is well laid out. I mean, the, the actual table that will tell you that if you're starting to work uh, when you are aged 20, 25 or 30, how much can you save for you to get to an income replacement rate of 70%? So those, those tables are there, but it's either we have not come across them or even those people who have come across them, they do not take it seriously. So they save, um they don't save enough that will see them through all the that will see them accumulate enough funds to take care of them um during retirement the other conundrum is that uh the, the life expectancy in kenya is also going up so people are living longer than they used to live before that means that if you are retiring at at 60, there's a chance that you might live up to 85. That means you should have money that should last you for another 25 years. Those are the kind of plans that people need to put in place. And they need to ask themselves, how can I save enough money that can outlive me irrespective of how long I'm going to live? And that is the big question that you are confounded with at the workplace. We're trying our best to create awareness um and we are succeeding you're not saying that you're not succeeding because you have also very positive cases you have seen people doing very well in their savings but i think generally probably majority 80 percent we can comfortably say that 80 percent of people who retire do not retire with enough income we can also blame the policy and regulatory environment for this because there is a lot of confusion and and in, in, the, in, in, the, in, in that environment, you know, um, we don't have one law that guides people to say, these are the minimum standards of practice for retirement saving and retirement preparation. Uh, although I'm happy to note that 
there is an effort, government doing an effort uh, in developing a national retirement uh, benefits policy, which, which is going to help to align everybody, employers, employees, self-employed people in terms of what they are supposed to do to ensure that by the time they retire, they have accumulated enough to, to outlive them. And uh, retirement uh, is not just about age. Retirement can also come through disability. So people need to know that uh, you can leave work earlier than you planned. So what are the kind of insurances that can, we can ride on or can ride on, the, on, the, on, on our pension schemes to make sure that if you're not able to continue saving, then your life insurance policy kicks in to ensure that you still meet uh, your goals. So I think let me not go beyond that. That is just what we are seeing in the employment environment. Okay, thank, thank, thank you very much. So let's, uh, let me see, let, because money is a big, big deal here. Let's, let's cover the, the poverty horseman. And I think we can go back to Patrick because you're the money guy. Um, so what are the practical, we've realized we are all poor. Uh, in okay, most of us are poor in retirement. What are the practical steps? How are the um, people Paul has said are successful um, doing it out there? And was Bitang and them all right? Should we build a house upcountry or not? You know, the, the, the issues on the ground are very valid, uh, but I think um, on Bitang and Demo's point of the dead capital, he was spot on um, because even today, people younger, not just the older ones, older than us and us, uh, Paul and I belong to the, uh, to the same generation. So we have a problem that was transferred to us culturally. Uh, at our ages, you are almost expected to be having a um, um, Taiga house in the village. But even today, people are still uh, doing a bit of a dead capital. There is, there is lower realization of the fact that if I had rental units, they would build me a house in a month. Uh, rather than uh, do that, there is still the higher affinity to build the dead capital house, the image house in the village. When, like Paul said, when the energy is still there, so we consume more money still today um, building those dead capital houses before we put in the investment. I think that's, a, that's going to be a challenge for a very long time. It is not one of those things that uh, uh, is showing any signs of change. Uh, maybe the, our kids, the, uh, the, the, the kids we have today, the 25 year old, might not relate to the village at all. But I think the 30, 35 year old upwards in most cultures still relate a lot to the village. It's the issue of, like he mentioned, the issue of, um, uh, of dependence, still very heavy. So as it, as it were on the ground, I think the best to even, to even imagine you can talk the word wealth uh, is, is not the thing, it's not the case. I have seen a few people who retired even when I was in class five living for very many years because they had meager resources saved and then their lifestyle was not expensive. The present retiree has, uh, the present day retiree has two problems. They are, they are in a world where people, are ex people have created an, an, a false expectations of a very high level of expenditure and their incomes can't support that. Uh, both uh, annuities and otherwise cannot support that. So there is that, that, that situation where uh, poverty is eating everything. You lose money to poor investment and whatever you remain with, which because the pension law here doesn't allow you to take two thirds of your money away. So you are receiving pension that is inflation is eating into. Um, there are very few good people who have turned that money around into investment. And I'll perhaps put that at three in every 10 retirees. Uh, seven in the other 10 are either living well because they, they had some assets that were producing for them money, but not really what they did post-retirement. Uh, that 
is, is the grim picture. It is not good. It, it, let's not cheat ourselves. It is not good. Okay, so let's let's go to because it seeps into um, Robina and Shalom's world, the the poverty itself. Um, Robina, <laughs> Robina, how uh, how is poverty being showing? Uh, how is poverty showing up in the clinical side? And then we can also just tackle the the health, uh, the illness and health and wealth um, as we ca uh, capture that. Are you on the call? Okay. Yes. Yes. Okay. So just uh, talk about poverty and uh, let's also just uh, cover the horseman that is health. Okay. And, so, and, um, and, and sorry, just uh, when should we start being healthy? I know like our muscle mass is at peak at 25 and um, yeah, just cover that bit. Okay. So um, I'll say poverty really hinders good um health outcomes in fact most um diseases they say they're quite prevalent in the poor settings in the low income settings and just being poor puts you in a position where you're bound to get these diseases one two you won't get the um, adequate management because in Kenya, you have to chip in, even if you have um, the normal NHIF, there's still a lot that you have to chip in out of your pocket. Um, and just being poor then hinders how far you can go in seeking medical um, services. Uh, you, you then have to think, um, do I think of food? Do I think of my children's school fees? or do I go and buy medicine? So by these choices that are faced uh, because we do not have enough money, then makes our decision on uh, health uh, seeking behavior go a bit lower. Then it also affects the quality of drugs that we get. It also then affects the complications that creep in because whatever illness we have is not adequately managed. So um, as a way of preventive medicine, I like it that um, we are now in a place where um, vaccines are mandatory because if it was left to be out of pocket, uh, at least for the children, then we'll see a lot of illnesses that come up and that uh, progress to um, uh, people as they grow older. Say polio, if, I, if we were not getting vaccines as children, then you can imagine how many people who progress into their old age will have polio um, and other illnesses. So I'm happy that we have things like vaccine. Um, as we grow up, I will say there is no time to say now it's a time to start um, uh, healthy living. This starts from when we are children, instilling good behaviors in our children, uh, because that is what they will carry on. If they're used to snacking on unhealthy food, that is probably bound to continue as we, as we age. Um, if we start instilling good uh, lifestyle practices right now, healthy eating, exercising adequately, um, regular checkups, then that is behavior that we are bound to carry on in the future. I will say prevention is what we all know. Prevention is better than cure. So if we can start preventing these illnesses right now, then we are even um, physiologically, we are uh, delaying aging in our own bodies. Something like exercise, it delays aging. Um, good diet, uh, things that are not refined and do not have a lot of, um, uh, uh, let me say, um, refined sugars, refined oils, uh, processed meat, that in a way, when we limit that from our diet, it 
helps in a big way in preventing aging, premature aging. Now for the people who already have the disease, then uh, close monitoring and close follow-up is key because that will ensure that if there are complications to come, then they'll be seen way before, way before um, we get to the older age. So someone like say has diabetes and uh, you go for regular checkups, they'll get to know at what point your kidney start having an injury and we can actually halt it and prevent rapid progression. Imagine getting to a point of just a few years before your retirement and you realize, oh, now I have to use my medical cover because maybe in two years I won't have um, a medical cover. Then you go in for tests at that time and then you realize, oh, your kidneys are not well. And in a few months you might need dialysis. So that kind of emotional um, what trauma that will come with just these diseases can be can be prevented. Um, so I've talked about prevention and early um, checkups to prevent uh, to prevent the complications. Um, and if the complications set in, then starting now to deal with them will put you in a better place when you have the financial muscle, say you are working right now, as opposed to later when you are retired and you might not have that financial muscle. Um, then uh, what, I'm, what I'm encouraging people nowadays is to at least get at least one insurance, medical insurance. I know probably um, that uh, Patrick will probably, or, or Paul will give us more information, but I encourage at least one medical insurance because in the older age, some medical insurance do not accept new members. Uh, it is easier to um, get insurance cover when you're younger, before you start having these complications. Some insurance say you have to stay for at least two years before you're covered from certain diseases, say cancers. We know cancers come as we age. Um, our chances of getting cancer increase as we grow older uh, because our body's uh, repair then goes down. So if we do not get the medical insurance right now and get it much later when uh, we can't use it at that point because we have to wait for that period of say two years before you're covered, then what happens in those two years? Who covers you? Where do you get the money from? Um, and part of just going for regular checkups gives you an idea of how much money you need to for medical upkeep. So if you go for, um, say you, you have hypertension and you go for a medical cover, you, I mean medical uh, checkup, you know consultation is this much, my medicine ca um, then it costs this much, you can extrapolate. Probably when I'll have retired, then um, the consultation will have gone maybe up by a thousand. So add that and the medicine maybe by another thousand, add that. It gives you an idea of how much you will need when you, when you uh, are much older. Yes. Well, thank you very much. And just for the issue of, um, I, I just want to know what, what, what is the uh, disease burden? What are you seeing in the older people in Kenya so that Tukai, I'm just guessing from the names I'm seeing here, Tukai Chonjo. Ah, so I'm seeing a lot of um, diabetes, a lot of hypertension, uh, a lot of kidney disease, heart, uh, heart disease. I'm seeing uh, what we call heart failure. Um, I'm seeing a lot of lung diseases. So even as we just go on with our daily lives now that we are younger, 
just remember that these things like smoking, uh, taking a lot of alcohol, they do have repercussions. Not now, might not show up right now, but maybe in the next 15, 20 years, then we'll see, oh, now I have lung cancer and this probably uh, was from my smoking ages. Um, now I have liver disease and it's probably because of my habits when I had uh, some money. So I'm seeing a lot of lifestyle um, diseases. So that is liver disease because of chronic alcohol intake and seeing cancers that are coming up, a lot of cancers, by the way, uh, a lot of cardiac disease, uh, heart disease um, and lung disease. Yes, diabetes and hypertension. Okay, thank you. So, so let me throw this to the, the finance and the HR people the two Ps, Paul and, and Patrick, uh, whoever um, wants to go, okay, both of you shall speak, but whoever calls dibs uh, can take the first um, stab at it. One is most insurances in health insurance in Kenya is um, through employ, uh, employment. So do we grandfather in people who've been in employment or once 55 ikifika, you're out of the gate. And two, um, what are you telling the, the young employees in terms of what we've had Robina saying? Like, um, are we educating them? Are we calling in? I know like when I used to work for AAR, we used to do health talks for companies and um, I, I, it wasn't very well received. People used to feel like it's just mandatory, but I feel like we need to make it a, a culture. And um, thirdly, when you're doing, um, especially um, Patrick, when you're doing your um, retirement talks, are you telling people about, are you bringing on medics to just talk about what Rubina has said? Whoever, um, uh, number one, I, I talk is a Paul, because I'm seeing you. Okay, Let me speak then, Paul. Paul oh, has the okay. Okay. Of, um, of office, if tell us on that. I'll talk about those who are already living. Yes, in terms of bringing in a medic to provide the medical uh, preparations, that's for a fact, like I said, uh, but that's for the companies that are offering a uh, pre-retirement plan. In retirement planning minute, and I've been offering pre-retirement planning for Octagon, and both of them bring in a medic. Uh, they bring in a psychologist, and they, they basically bring a full a full health view. Um, today, I can tell you that Minet offers the whole package. It's a whole division that offers wellness, and it's all areas of wellness. It's not just given to people at retirement. It is provided to people while they're in employment. Like I said, the challenge is not the availability of such resources. The challenge is in the availability of either the budget on the on the side of the employer to provide what you would call a full board kind of opportunity because it costs money uh, in which case then um, people st start to get this information quite early uh, I, I i i offer that service actually to minute on my small financial side and i see a panel of everyone the issue is not the lack of availability. The issue is of the industry adopting it. Or that are the extent to which the industry has adopted it as a practice because we, they don't just offer wellness to retiring people. They offer wellness to companies in general uh, at, at all stages. So that is available. Um, in terms of insurance, medical insurance, uh, there's medical insurance for people who are still within the, the ages of, of, of 60 to 70. Um, it is typically up to 70. Beyond 70, entering becomes a problem. So you ought to have been in the scheme to continue beyond 70. Um, I, I, I don't know, Paul might know that. I don't know anyone in insurance that will take you in after 70, but they take you in before you turn 70. And once you are in, there is no end to, there's no age limit to it. What changes is uh, when your risk profile uh, increases, then your premiums also grow up. Uh, they become a little bit more expensive than they would have been for the same you in a 
a little healthier. I'm, I'm just 53, but because I've already had stroke, if I were to go into um, yeah, an insurance today to look for a completely new uh, policy, I would be having a slightly higher premium than I would I have now because I'm, I'm, I'm inside. Paul? Okay, I think it's important to mention that uh, for now, uh, the law provides for what you call post-retirement medical insurance. So a member of any retirement benefit scheme can also save for their retirement insurance. And I think so many uh, retirement benefit schemes have adopted this, they have put in the rules, the regulations, and they're telling their members, please, apart from saving for your retirement, put in some little more money, which is aside. It is not, I mean, it is, it is a separate fund where you save and this money will be utilized to buy for you um, a, a medical scheme when you retire. The government is also trying to consolidate all these social issues because you, you, you've already seen an attempt to bring in housing, although the, the, the regulations were um, annulled by the court. So government is looking at this retirement benefit sector as a panacea or a solution to many of the retirement needs. So we have the financial, the health, and, and the housing already being brought in. So for me, uh, I would want to say that where it begins for every other person uh, who is employed is please be a member of a retirement benefit schemes. Even if your employer does not, does not have uh, an in-house medical scheme, what you call an occupational pension scheme, you can also have an individual pension plan. The rules are the same, the benefits are the same. You can also uh, ask your employer, even if it's not willing to sponsor, it can facilitate checkoff so that you can, you, you, you can take your money to, to an individual plan or the employer can join what you call an umbrella scheme. If he's not willing to be involved in the running of a pension, whereby he just deducts all your money, puts in his small um, contribution and then sends to an umbrella scheme. There are so many umbrella schemes in Kenya. If you go to the RBA website, you'll be able to get a list of them. Uh, the, the other most important thing is that uh, it's what you're calling about uh, insurance. It's very good to have a rider because your plans can be can be cut short, can be cut short anytime. Uh, pension schemes are adopting the concept of wellness, and uh, I think many of them every year they do an awareness session where I'm seeing just uh, apart from just talking about the money and the scheme and how it's running. Uh, they're talking about health, how people are supposed to prepare. They're talking about how people are supposed to handle their families because family is a pillar that you'll need in retirement. And uh, just for like for my case on Friday, we had ours, we are doing a mentor, talking to men about what they need. We brought in a doctor, uh, the, the scheme came, came in with a doctor and the doctor was talking to men about health issues that are specific to, to men. And uh, we are seeing that the, the interest is, people are beginning to get interested because they are seeing ahead of them, whether they are parents or any other people who are ahead of them, the kind of experiences they have gone through. And uh, rational people do not want to go through the same experience. We also have others who don't care and they're not doing the right thing. But I think a majority uh, are, are doing the right thing. One other thing I wish to mention is the concept of encouraging people because uh, the adequacy of saving can also be achieved through something we call additional voluntary contribution. This can give, help you to get more money into your saving so that even at the time you're retiring, then you, have, you can exercise bigger options. You can have a bigger pension plan, month, giving you a monthly income. You can take part of the money and buy a medical scheme to take care of you. So if you're in a scheme, the more you save, the better because it will open to you, at the end of it, it will open to you to um, Nini, more choices. You'll have more choices to make than if your basket is, is very small. Thank you. Thank you. So um, Sh Shalom, um, you're up. So uh, just speaking on the poverty, I just wanted to, um, to, uh, to, to ask to start on the, the horseman that's loneliness. Um, what are you seeing on the ground? And I just want you to also 
um, give a word of, of advice to we people in diaspora. Um, I know for sure if you, uh, most people uh, bring their, their, the parents they favor. So if I, if I was close to my mom, I'll bring them here and just leave my dad in the village and they just suffer alone. Um, can you speak to the poverty and loneliness in retirement? Wow, okay. Um, what, uh, what should I say? Let me start with what you have ended with. This one of bringing your parents, the, the favored parents. I've noticed that people, like you're saying, yes, people in diaspora are bringing that parent, sometimes both, but then a lot of the time it's mothers who are coming. And I want to link that to the breakdown of family units where, and it didn't start now. It's not just something that's happening now. There was a time when there was this uh, exodus of mothers into the, especially the United States and such places in the pretext of taking care of their grandchildren because culturally they didn't want to divorce. So they want to leave their husbands, but they don't want to divorce. And so they would uh, leave to go take care of their grandchildren and never come back. So we had lots of people move out because of that. But at the same time, while they were moving away, they were not thinking, when I die, where do I want to be buried? And so we started having situations where, OK, so now they're dying or they're falling sick. And now we are trying to reconcile a couple that parted long before. You know, it wasn't even quite a divorce. They parted early. And so when that woman comes back, for instance, and either she comes back because her husband is now in ailing health, and therefore she's still loyal enough to take care of him, you find they still have no connection, which is something that I think is so, so key to mental wellness, even in retirement. When we are working and we are young and pushing on with um, business and life and all those other things that are required, we take for granted uh, the things that keep us mentally healthy. When you're young, yes, you have a positive attitude, but we we leave it in youth and not carry it as we are growing older. And we become more cynic as we are growing older. Then the other thing is the connection, that human connection that I'm saying. You took mother to diaspora, then she comes back to take care of her husband that she never connected with. So they die of loneliness anyway, right? And so if I could say what's happening with loneliness, loneliness is coming a lot from a lack of connection with the people, uh, you married the people you connected with at work. You find that once retirement comes, you all disconnect and people go into their circles. What would I say? Please build li lifelong connections that are outside of your workspace. If all your friends are those who you work with, then you'll need to be extremely intentional post-retirement, right? So build those healthy connections. Start doing something now that you actually enjoy doing. Many of us wait to enjoy life after we have retired. You know, you slog, you slog, you slog, then you say, I'll have fun when I retire. Then you find that by the time you're retiring, you have even no idea how what having fun is. You don't, you don't know what that looks like. So if you are told go golfing, you don't know what that looks like. That's probably fun for one person and not for you. So start doing this, these activities and hobbies that actually take you away from your regular life. Start enjoying holidays and you know just taking taking time off from these things that are stressing you. Why is that when you when you have focused your life on one thing only and then that thing is taken away, that vacuum can be depressing. That vacuum leaves people empty. They leave you um, just getting into dark places because now what is your wife? What is your life worth? What's your life worth? Post, post retirement. Now, poverty, and I think the financial guys like Patrick and Paul are talking very well on the poverty end. Um, if I look at how that is affected in the psychological space, we are having families later and therefore by the time we are retiring, even at that 65, you're finding a 65 year old probably has a 15 year old child. Now, if you're retiring just when you're son or daughter is getting into high school, your retirement funds are not for you only. You know, you still have to have considered the school fees and things like that. And therefore you're finding, even when they may have thought they have saved enough, it's no longer enough because they still have another eight to 10 years 
of educating this young person. And therefore the demand on the wealth, the demand on the money, let me not call it wealth, the demand on the money that we are coming into retirement with is actually getting higher just because of the family structure. And people are not talking about, they're not talking enough about family development and the effects of some of the decisions we make early on in life. And of course that is leading to the, you know, the poor health and loneliness are so related because there's a connection between mind and body. When I was hearing Robina listing the illnesses that she's seeing on the ground, you know, uh, you're seeing diabetes, hypertension. Hypertension is being caused by stress that, that is overriding in the body. But we have those diseases like the cancers and all that are being caused by hidden stress. You have survived, umengangana, you know, you have, you have kept at it and pushed and pushed and pushed until by the time your whole body is collapsing, it's your body saying no on your behalf, right? That doctor that we like, Dr. Gabo Mate, talking about the cost of hidden stress, you hide it for as long as it will take for you to deliver on your job. You hide it to deliver on your marriage. You hide it to deliver on your, you know, to be a good mother or a good father. We're having lots of Father's Day messages. Even as Saya was saying, a woman will carry a baby for nine months. A man will carry that baby for life because they still have to feed them, clothe them and do all those other things. So you have carried this stress and not dealt with it in a healthy way, after retirement, you're left you and your stress. And it can be very overwhelming. How is that connected with loneliness? If you have been connecting with people, you will not be alone going through that. Somebody was asking, uh, there was a question that had come about you know, some scheme for people who are at 70. I don't remember what the question was, but if I'm retiring at 70 and I have connected with a fellow 70 year old, then we can go through this together in terms of just keeping each other company. Then as much as possible, look for goals post 70. I know there is, yes, your goal may not necessarily be about finances, but what are you working towards? Is there that thing that can make you wake up every morning, even if you're going to rest three days a week? What does rest is not about sitting, doing nothing. Rest is about lack of stress, you know? So how do you actually, then manage to connect post 70. If you're connecting post 70, can you afford to? That's where Patrick will give us the advice. How do you ensure that if I want to go, I'm 70 years old and I want to go away on a holiday with my friend, are we going to be able to afford that holiday or are we going to depend on our children? So let's say, let's say we are going to depend on our children. I think there's a comment about you know the village, the role of the village. Those days people were expected to take care of their grandparents. Today, we are carrying the expectation without the relationship. If your retirement plan is your children, it shouldn't be. <laughs> but if your retirement plan is your children, at least build a good relationship with them so that they will want to take care of you. Because what's happening in the family setup, what I'm seeing a lot of is parents have neglected the children, then they expect the children to know how to relate with them later. And yet we are bringing up African children, let me call them African, in a modern world, which does not have African values and cultural norms. So the way I may have grown up knowing that as my parents grow old, I should take care of them, my children haven't seen that. So they don't know that that is an expectation. And if I'm not communicating it, and I'm not saying tell them, you will take care of me, is build enough of a relationship to have them take care of you and not just uh, take care of you from the baby needy part. It is come visit you, come connect with you, spend a holiday with you. We'll find that most of our old people die of loneliness because they're no longer considered, they almost become non-human, if I may call it that, when they grow old. Like, and all they're probably asking for is, can you come and spend an afternoon with me? Let's chat. Um, Saya mentioned about the library dying. You know, when, a, when a, um, an old person in Africa dies, a whole library dies with him. Old people may not necessarily be having an illness, but just because they're not moving around doesn't mean they have nothing to offer. So if we can get places where the generations are connecting with each other, where we are getting young people go and connect with old people. Um, we had something I think I saw, was it in Zimbabwe, where there were 
grandmothers who are being used to hug people or just to listen or just to give advice. If we can bring this village back, then we will not have the levels of loneliness that we have. We have reached a place where we have apps that will help us deliver food to our grandparents. And therefore we assume we don't need to see them. They will die of loneliness. They will be healthy, healthy physically, but die of loneliness. Then poor health. You find some of them, I've had um, interactions with people who are unwell, but would refuse to go to hospital because they want to die. Right, so instead of taking care of that health, they're saying, but nobody cares for me. So where they should be going to have their insulin levels checked, you find them faint and collapsing at home, saying they actually want their child to be the one to come because they're begging for that connection. So I feel as though if we could connect, first and foremost, each human being needs to take responsibility for their connection. But for those of us who have somebody older in your family, are you able to actually go connect with this older person? Just to say hi, just to say, how are you doing? Just to ask them, what, do you, what are you looking forward to? What are you looking back at? What would you advise me? The minute you are making them feel relevant in your life, they feel connected and therefore loneliness ends. Poverty, yes, as you're saying, uh, we need to consider whatever your, whatever your stage in life right now, you need to consider that whatever you're saving for, the people around you may be people who suck it out of you at the time of retirement. Meaning your children, and not because they're doing it, um, like I said, we are starting our families later, and therefore we are retiring when we still have dependents. You need to take care of that. When it comes to, so probably like to summarize what I would say, if you want to take care of your mental wellness before retirement, is build positive connections, build rich relationships outside of your workspace. Even if it's going to be with a colleague, but not around work, build those positive um, connections, have a good attitude towards life. You have something to offer, then have, have goals. It, it doesn't matter even if it is, I want to go to Israel. Just have something that you're working towards. Go on that pilgrimage. You know, do something that you're going to feel like waking up for every single day. And then hobbies, just do something, start doing it now. I remember before my dad retired, one of the things he used to do was walk. So post-retirement, it was very easy to keep walking. It becomes harder to start things. It's not just insurance covers that are hard to start. Hobbies are also hard to start if you're trying to start them when you retire. Start practicing early and that will help you out. Yeah, thanks. Um, thank you. No, it's um, at Sia's con uh, comment. I'm going to read it. It's, um, it's poignant. Um, Sia, I want you to put, put your fake um, pastor hat on. What's the role of the, the church in all in full retirement? And then the panelists, I want us to, after Sia goes, um, I want us to see what what are your nuggets for, for the different um, age sets. So 25 to 40, because we like, each start working at 25 properly, 25 to 40, 40 to 55, 55 to 70. What are you advising people to plan for towards that retirement goal? Uh, but meanwhile, as, as you, uh, this would be, if it was a studio, this would be 20 qua, qua advertisers. But as you sip your water and think through that, um, Saya, just put on your fake hat and come on as the religious person here. Yeah. So the role of church in, in preparing uh, people for retirement, one is our faith affects our lives in ways that are multiple, more than we more than is tangibly, more than is tangibly expressible. And so and, and people's faith will be a steady companion for them. It helps them make um, sense. One of the, um, um, as been mentioned, one of the concerns is loneliness, but also one of the concerns is hope, you know, and as people are moving into retirement and living in retirement, there's a lot of looking back and asking yourself, did, did um, does my life matter? Um, have I counted? Was it worth it? And what faith, 
um, does is it gives you um, additional tools and gives you a comprehensive framework to try and look at what you have achieved in life and look forward to where you're going. So church and Christianity and faith well done provides therefore an anchor and a set of tools to help navigate that. That's one. And then secondly, um, it if there's a brilliant place for um, retired people to keep giving of themselves, I think the church provides such a very good venue, um, especially if it's a church that is active in the community and in its diversity. For instance, a church I did attend when um, I was still in Kenya um, has a very elaborate um, high school's ministry. And the way it's done is there is an elder attached to each of the schools. And I did notice that quite a number of people, even in their retirement, still kept doing the high school's ministry because at least it gave them some grandpa vibe and it was a chance to be able to give back. And there are multiple opportunities within the church circle. I just cited the school's ministry as one, but there are multiple opportunities for um, people who are retired. Remember you're retired, but you're not necessarily tired. You're retired, but not retarded. You're retired and there's all this world of experience that you have and the church through its work in the community and its work within just the church itself gives um, retirees ample opportunity. And even when you go to the rural uh, places, like I see with my own um, folks who, who are retired and upcountry, they're able to, the church for them gives them, <laughs> actually at times makes them super busy. Um, like mommy's singing in the choir, she's um, chairing things, she's, you know, moving. She even calls and says like, hey, I'm going for a, for a retreat. So it provides a great place for, for socialization around individuals with shared interest, shared values and, and all of that. So as a, as a venue to prevent loneliness and simultaneously be able to give yourself productively to earthy things, a church is, a, is an epic place. And then the, um, the, what is it called? The beliefs and the teachings that the um, church is able to give are able to center and are able to anchor an individual um, well. Now, for all of these benefits of faith to accrue, they need to be punctuated with intentionality. Churches can't just wish it. They, can, they need to be intentional about it. A good example I see is there's a church um, in the New York area um, that has built now in the West, and this is for these people who, in the, in, the, in, the, in the West, it's not like in Africa where our retired parents either live with us or go back to the village and they have this community in the West. A lot of people who retire, not all, but a lot of people who retire going to senior living. So what one church community has done is they have built um, a senior living place and use it as a spot for ministry. Like they reach to the older people, they minister to them and they um, use them, the older people to do various things from that. So in settings like the West, where the that's the way they handle their old people, um, I, I may have my different feelings about that. The church as an entity, because of its organizing ability and its ability to bring several people together can create facilities and opportunities where old people or retired people um, can be able to function healthily and in a normal balanced way. And then finally is one, I think, unique gift the church gives is um, because of its um, multi-culture, its multi-generational possibilities like people who come to church are from childhood to the very old. It's a very healthy place for cross mentorship, for people headed to retirement and for people going through retirement. Therefore, um, if, if you hang out like um, in my church tradition in, in Africa, people stay in church basically the whole day. And it's usually a beautiful thing to watch them during lunchtime because it's the time where um, the older, the grandpa is sitting with the grandchildren and the children are playing around. It, 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 if for nothing else, for just that one day, um, the older people, the retired people 
are given a chance to be around their grandchildren or younger people to be consulted. And that gives a lot of lease of life, as it were. And then I think finally is the church by pulling together talents. I mean, people from different backgrounds, finance, health, and everything is a good training ground. It provides enough professionals to be able to provide adequate training. Um, I've noticed some churches now have even started saving and um, credit organizations, which is going to be useful for helping individuals navigate their, uh, what is it called? Helping people navigate their financial component within retirement. So well done, well done, well thought through. The church is an epic place to provide training for individuals headed to retirement and to provide support for individuals going through um, retirement itself. Back to you, Paul. Okay, so we go to the, uh, the, the question. Let me start with the money people. So um, let me, yeah, let me start with Patrick. So what are you advising the, the, the age sets I've said, 25 to 40, 40 to 55, 55 to 70 about retirement? Um, I need to I need to show a slider there. Okay, I see you have if powers. I, yeah. Yes, if I can, I think it would be better. Okay. Um, and I and while to... you're looking for your slide, can I just ask for we diasporans who want to escape the winter, what are you advising us? Do we come back home or we just die here? Um, okay, good. What I have on the screen there speaks of various ages. Unfortunately, um, the people on the lower side, four or five, which are the early ages of the beginning to generate income, do not have a psychological connection with retirement. As much as we speak a lot to them about uh, this, uh, get into investment that is long term that will create the kind of future you want. Um, the, the, the typical young Kenyan and perhaps young East African, I uh, could take it even to South African countries because I've gone to quite a number of them. They don't quite connect with the retirement. There is a very strong sense of um, YOLO. You live only once. Um, when you need to be careful when you say enjoy your life early, you might just be telling some people that uh, they should continue with the dangerous path. It's actually a very big issue with below 35 year olds. Um, my own history, when I was 29 years old, I was earning the highest amount of income among my peers but I did not use the money. So right now I can only talk about the payslip, not pay effect. If I needed to have invested, that was the best time. We had a problem in our past. We didn't have a lot of investment options. We didn't have a lot of investment information. That is not the situation today. Today we have a lot of information and we also have a lot of options and you can then invest as early as possible, the smallest amount of money that you can afford. Today, 100 shares, which is the minimum purchase size in the Nairobi Stock Exchange, can cost as little as 400 to around 4,000 or more shares. Uh, so uh, there's nobody who will tell you at the age of 22 and 28 that they, that they don't have sufficient income. But I can confirm you that the issue is the challenge of connecting with that idea of investing for the future. That is a big challenge that we need to get over right now because my age, who are now in number eight, are experiencing the gap of what we did not do for lack of information and lack of um, options in those ages. I bought my NBK, NBK shares when I was 25, 26 years old. And I, I was forced to sell them recently when NBK was bought. Other I was as well to cut them. But of course, they were doing fairly well for a very poor company. But if, if the younger person of 24 up to 35 can connect with the retirement in, in age that my, my scale here is showing us number nine into 10, if they can connect as early as possible 
and start to invest long term, invest in small assets, invest regularly, as opposed to wait to invest big monies later, they would be doing themselves a lot of good. Because in ages marked there, number six and number seven, school fees will be a very big expense in your life. So if you don't create assets to take care of these school fees expenses and still leave you with the income for retirement and in beyond number nine, because any asset you buy early will not only provide income for uh, your needs in age six and seven in terms of those extra needs, uh, it will also become a source of retirement benefit, which was not the case when we were younger here. You would look for a house for two years when I was around 30. Today, houses are more than you require. The question is, you don't have the money. So things are very different and, and the past should not then necessarily explain the future. Now, those who are at 40, 43, 49, and 50, 56, we call that age reconnaissance. You are reconciling the mistakes of the past, mistakes of age mark number four, age mark number five, and age mark number six, and even a bit of number seven, because when those children begin to graduate, depending on when you set up your family, they begin to release money back. What you focus on with that money is important. If you didn't do your dead capital, Bitangen demo, demo message, if you didn't do that dead capital, a lot of people tend to rush home and do that dead capital, either in the number seven or, or eight. That is still um, a poor choice. If you if 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 you if school fees has eaten you up, and, and so you need to prepare well for in the, for, for for retirement, number eight and a bit of early nine and late seven, those are years when you reconcile, uh, you try to use the money to create um, to best, basically enhance your retirement. You will not retire with the best amount of money, but you are definitely better than a person who did not do do anything. Uh, so you're still going to have a good retirement. Like I said, psychological awareness is key. Now, in number 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 10 and 11, you are basically in the consumption phases. So when you're retiring now, and you're now depending on the pension, for example, then the kind of choices you make with your, um, uh, with your annuity uh, purchases, and of course, uh, the options of income drawdown then become very important. Let me perhaps address that in more detail. Um, because a lot of companies don't offer good quality training uh, when you are retiring. A lot of people leave when they are not very clear about the differences in annuities. There are what you call guaranteed annuities and the open-ended annuities. The guaranteed annuities will pay you for a fixed period, 10, 15 years you choose uh, the period you want. They'll pay you a high amount, but when that period is over, the annuity is also over. The open-ended annuity will pay you until you die. The only difference is the guaranteed annuities will take care of you and of whoever remains, if you are to pass on, um, whoever remains that, like your spouse, would still be receiving the annuity. The open-ended annuity, even if you died one day, after signing papers, it is over for you. You will not, your family won't receive any money. So you better get to understand those small undertones. The, the option of income drawdown that has come in lately is to help those that are not making a lot of, that are not carrying home a lot of money to, uh, to draw their, to draw their, uh, their, their, to be receiving a monthly amount from their pension without buying an annuity. Uh, through an open investment, but you have it for a fixed period of, say, 10 years. And if anything remains after that, you have the choice of either taking it all home or still continuing with the previous option. So getting good training uh, at, at a time when you're about to retire, have a very good idea of the annuity options would be very essential. What I would say to the younger people is this. In Kenya today and in East Africa generally, we are, in, we are in an infrastructure development phase, and it will be, the, it'll be here for another 20 years or so. I think still uh, we, we lack housing in all the East African cities, and housing will still remain a very big challenge. 
So rental property is still going to be very profitable in the next 20 years or so. It would be advisable to buy a small rental property early so that you get the capital gain and you also get cash. That will help you build your income faster and prepare you better uh, for the days after the age of 60. I think that's what I would say uh, for now. Perhaps any other I'll respond to through question and answer. I'll remove my slides for now. Okay, thank you. Um, Paul, you're next. And if you have a slide, we wouldn't mind it. This was very informative. I don't have a slide, unfortunately. Okay. Uh, but in the same context, I'll, I, I have to say this, that um, it is important for everyone at the beginning to make a choice where, whether they want to be career people or business people. And when you make a career, you want to be a business, a career person, then there are certain rules that you will have to live with in order for you to succeed in the long journey. Um, because one is, the first one is of course, is to secure your career and do everything that makes you sustainable in the profession that you are in. Then the next thing is about how do you use the income you get from, from that. So as far as um, age and uh, prioritization is concerned, I have always argued that um, the key things in life is about a home, education for your children, and your retirement. That's where your finance goes. And of course, health. And uh, if, if somebody has a career lifespan of about 30 years, it is possible for them to achieve all this adequately based on how they are planned their income. Sometimes I just normally tell people in the office when they come and say, it is difficult I tell them, look at your pay slip and uh, let us be very practical. Uh, out of 100% of your salary, 30% goes to tax. And the law says that 33% should go to uh, take home. So you are left with what? 37%. So you are supposed to plan your life around the 37% in terms of saving and building wealth that will uh, help you in future. So this 37% is what you allocate, uh, basically what you save so that you can make investment choices around home ownership, education for your children, health insurance, or, uh, or, or I mean, healthcare, and uh, finally, um, retirement benefits. So within the first 10 years, there is something that you can achieve depending on your prioritization or the first 15. So let's, let's assume you started working at 25. You can say within the first 15 years, probably you have not your dream home, but you have a home. And I think the biggest problem people do is that when they think about a home, they only want to achieve that dream home. But sometimes you have to start from somewhere. So you can have a decent, humble home within the first 15 years. That is around 30, uh, 40 years. Then the next uh, 10 years, you can put all your effort in educating your children because I think one of the key things we know is that if your children do not become independent, then they, are, they will give you the, the nightmare, the worst nightmare in your retirement. So spend as much money you, you want to spend reasonably to make sure that they grow up to be independent. And probably in your last 10 years now, your priority can be around uh, building your retirement uh, basket. So I believe every person in his own unique way can try and achieve this. If one, um, they, 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 they come to the knowledge that retirement, the responsibility for planning for retirement is personal. Nobody owes you a retirement plan or a retirement benefit, not your mother, not your father, not your son, not your daughter, not your government. In any case, government is only giving those it gives 2,000 shillings. So once 
you you recognize it's your responsibility you can work through these steps you work in your career you grow and uh, the income that you get from that career you direct it to these priorities and i confidently want to say that kenya has a vibrant retirement benefits sector with one of the best regulators that we've ever seen it is very safe if you save your money in any retirement uh, institution in Kenya, benefits institution, you are guaranteed that your money is safe, it will grow and you will get it at the right time. Instead of juggling between your career and some risky investments, I think for me, I just say, uh, if you're not good at business, just, just don't do it. Save your money in a retirement benefit scheme. I think you'll be better off getting something at the end of it all than regretting. And I give the best example I give is with the teachers. The most humble people in our society, they don't get a lot of money, but over time they build a nice home in the village and they take their kids to school through the circles. And when they retire, government gives them some little um, lump sum followed by a monthly stipend. In fact, nowadays in our village, when you see any Toyota fielder, chances are that it belongs to a retired teacher. They're able to drive when they retire because they follow through a nice, humble way of their managing their, their, their resources. And at the end of it all, they meet all their objectives. Of course, the other thing I normally say when it comes to children is, try as much as possible so that uh, your children can 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 can, can uh, <laughs> so that your children can, can can be better than you you know so that your children can be better than you and uh, you know it'll be, it will be good if if your children do better than you so spend money on them if you're a primary school teacher then let your kid be a secondary school teacher and if you are a second school teacher, let your kid go beyond, be a lecturer. At least you have done your bit in trying to remove poverty out of your generation. Yeah. So these are things that employees need to know. It is their responsibility. And sometimes I do help uh, individuals and institutions through a lesson I call a 10 point lesson for retirement, where I just try and show people that, look, this thing is inevitable and it will come. So when you have the time and you have the opportunity, please plan for it. We have the, the framework, we have the infrastructure, we have the laws, we have the regulations, and you can save your money and live a decent life. Money that you will outlive you and money that you might leave to your generation to, to carry on. So I think uh, coming back to the, uh, to, to, to the workplace environment is a question of organizations need to pay attention to employee well-being in and beyond employment. It's not good for an organization just to, to be uh, concerned about the well-being or the wellness of their employees during their working life and then ignore the life after. So this is what I call total wellness. So total wellness will make sure that an employer has plans that supersede the lifespan of an employee in the organization by simply trying to uh, foresee the needs of the employee after retirement and helping the employee to plan. The employer may not have all the resources to, to do that. So it's up to the employee to do, uh, to make sure that they work hand in hand, take advantage of what the employer has provided and also give in their share so that they can be able to make that, that progress. We have seen a lot of development in this. I talked about uh, AVC, additional voluntary contribution as one way. And the more you talk about employees, the more you see one or two of them enroll. They just come in and say, I want to add 1,000 more. I want to add 2,000 more on a monthly contribution. Over time, you find they're adding 5,000, 10,000. And it, I mean, at the end of the day, it becomes good money they can talk about. So I, I can confidently say that People who are uh, employed and people who have an income have an opportunity to lead a decent and comfortable life by investing in the existing uh, 
investment schemes that have been established since they are well regulated and uh, the returns are there for, for many people to see. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Robina, you're up. Shalom, uh, Utatufungia Ukurasa. Robina, you're up. <laughs> Oh, can you hear me? Yes. Now, let me say before we wind up that um, I've learned a lot, even as as um, uh, as young as I am, or as old as I am, <laughs> in preparing for for retirement. I may not get another chance to say that this was a good and timely talk. Now. Um, as we look at what we can do from a um, health perspective, um, let us not divorce the fact that um, poverty and loneliness really impact on, um, on our health seeking behavior and also impact greatly on health outcomes. Um, if someone has uh, lost resolve in living, then pro, uh, the outcomes are not good. If someone does not have money, then it limits their health seeking behavior. And in uh, so doing, um, puts a barrier in how much they can uh, get from health services, puts a barrier on where they can go to seek for help, to what level of speciality they can go to seek for help and what medications they are therefore able to, um, to afford in trying to um, just uh, get better results. Now, um, I know, uh, Posa, you had asked if we could break it down um, according to ages, so that people who are already past maybe the first bracket of 25 to 40, so that they don't feel like they've already been left behind by the train, I'll put it as um, generally for everyone, it's never too late to start. Um, I'll say build um, healthy lifestyles. And this involves a good diet, a good um, exercise plan, um, good health seeking behavior, go for regular checkups, know where your status is. It doesn't mean if you have, if you do not have hypertension right now, who knows 20 years from now what the case is, it might come. So as we envision to live longer and have the hopes of having, uh, say living past, 65, past the retirement age, past 70 and 80, let us not be blind to the fact that that is when most diseases really check in. And as we uh, think about that, let us surround ourselves with um, community or people of like-mindedness. If you're trying to quit, smoking, it doesn't help to, to go and uh, meet up with people who are smoking. You'll be tempted to go back to smoking. If you're trying to quit uh, alcohol, then it won't help to go to a pub where everyone is uh, taking alcohol and you, you're taking Fanta. It, it then becomes a bit hard to break these um, addictions. So um, building, um, surrounding yourself with people who you want um, to have similar behaviors, say a healthy lifestyle really helps. Then stress, as Shalom said it, is a really big killer. Um, the silent stress and the one we talk about, they all have an impact on our lives and on the health of our bodies. So having, a, let me uh, call it, a a healthy channel to channel out this uh, stress, then is very important. Um, early screening of diseases. Um, I'm happy that most doctors nowadays encourage people past the age of 50 to start screening for these uh, cancer cancers and just uh, encourage people on uh, checking their blood pressure, their blood sugar. And you shouldn't start when you're 50. 
um, we all know people who have had cancers way before age of 50 or way before age of 40. It won't hurt to just go for regular screening. Um, start thinking of a medical cover as soon as possible. Doesn't mean if you're 25 and uh, uh, that it is too early to start to think of a medical cover. As um, Patrick and um, uh, uh, Paul said, once you've started, you can then continue in that medical cover. Like if you start at 25, then you can continue, but beyond the age of 70, then it becomes a bit harder to join um, a medical cover. Um, then start thinking of your life post-retirement in the sense that the energy that you have right now, the good health you might be enjoying right now, might not be the same um, as we age. And what therefore does that mean as years go by? Um, I know people who, when they think of that, have then made a radical change in the way they eat, in the way they, um, uh, how much exercise they indulge in. And I want to encourage all of us to start having that mentality that we are building um, muscles, we are build, building strong, strong bones right now for uh, the time that we shall be older. So if we do not exercise right now, we do not build enough muscle, we'll be more frail as we age. If we do not get the healthy lifestyle right now, as we age, it's bound to get worse. Um, then regular checkups will uh, be, you'll be able to see when complications uh, set in. And if you can therefore see when the complications set in, you can either stop them from progressing too fast or actually revert that disease to a point where you do not have complications. It's just management of the, of the disease. Um, I, those are the things that I, I think as take home message from a medical perspective. I see, again, I'll mention this, I'll see a lot of people who do not um, prepare adequately for, for diseases that come in old age, and then their children have to stop their lives and stop providing uh, for their families to come and take care of, of, um, um, of uh, them in old age. I know it's very un African to start thinking of what if I get to a point where I'm, I'm, I'm having dementia, do I let that burden fall on my children or do I tell them it is okay to take me to a, um, an old, uh, uh, a home, a home where people who are having the same condition are, can be looked after. I know it's very an, uh, an, an African to start thinking of such things, but I'll encourage us to think in the event that such a thing happens, who therefore takes care of me? Who therefore uh, do I expect my children to stop their lives to uh, come and take care of me? Is it their responsibility or do I relieve them of that and tell them then it is okay, I can go to a, maybe a home where I can be looked after. So these are the things I will encourage. There's no right answer, there's no wrong answer, but starting to think of them early enough then removes the emotional beat uh, when, we, when we are much older. Thank you. Thank you very much. And if I could put on my medic hat for two seconds, um, just remember, especially in the West, once an old person falls, it's usually like downhill from there. And so you need to, as, as Robina has said, build your muscle. You don't have to look like um, what was it, Rambo. You just need to uh, walk and use your body weight. Build your muscle, build your bones. Once you fall, it's usually downhill from there. Uh, for the people who have medical cover, um, they, are, they are these packages, you know, those wellness packages, take advantage of them. Have, uh, have yourself checked while you're still in employment so that you at least bulletproof yourself from um, serious issues in the future. And uh, Shalom, you're up. 
You know, it's interesting when Sorry, I was hearing please. Robina. Okay, go ahead. Uh, uh, okay, in the spirit of what Nicholas is asking, um, if you the panelists, if you're able to share what is shareable in terms of your contacts or how you can be reached, and people, Mukumbuke, this is work they need to be to be paid. Musiende uko vitu zabure ni abure. I'm just being open and honest. At least pay them for this so that they can um, come back to, on this panel next time. Yeah, go ahead, Shalom. I think Robina was trying to say something. Oh, no, 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 no. All sorry. right. Oh, sorry. Okay. Yeah, I was saying it's interesting that uh, Robina has talked about it. You have talked about it. It was one of the things I was going to start when it comes to what should the 25 to 40 year old be doing? And it is that exactly that build muscle early, start exercising. And I talked about that because you're saying 25 to 40. You see, that's a very wide gap. And that's a time, yes, for sure, start eating well, uh, build that muscle, start investing. I won't go into the money part because that has been spoken about a lot. I'm, I want to look at it from a psychosocial perspective. As much as possible, build relationships early. Why are you building relationships? Why is relationships key? Remember I was saying that they will be the ones that help you out of the loneliness. And of course, as a result, the poverty and poor health, because the healthier and richer your relationships, the more you're going to be investing together anyway. You know, birds of a feather basically will flock together. So start practicing those relationships early. If you dump a friend when you're 25, you have enough time to make up and get rich relationships. So start building on those as early as you possibly can. When you're in the age of 40, 40 to 50, you talked about 40 to 55. Now, when it comes to those relationships, start narrowing down on which ones are key. Um, we were having a conversation with friends the other time and we were saying, it's okay to, you know, when you're young, you have friends who are your friends in general. You know, and they cut across most spheres. As you grow older, and I loved the table, the slide that Patrick shared. As you grow older, you will need friends who are your friends in marriage setting, your friends as parents, your friends as investors. You know, in the different stages, you start specializing in the friend that you actually have. Don't try and be everything to everyone or expect all your friends to be the same thing to you. Otherwise, you're going to miss out on good value. There are friends of yours who are going to be very good for that walk of faith that Sai is talking about. So they're good when it comes to praying, worshiping, whatever it is that you'll do as far as your act of faith is concerned. But they're horrible when it comes to business. So stop going to seek financial advice from your pastor. Have financial uh, savvy, financially savvy friends, even as you have these nice Christian friends. So understand that your psychosocial support is really going to be dependent on what you're trying to get out of your life. And around that place, I'd like to connect with a question that had been asked about the HRs. You know, HRs handle people. You know, the resource that they, the HR human resource team are handling are people. And they don't, they haven't been very quick to pick up this thing of, of helping people with the retirement strategies and how to basically explore opportunities of how life is going to be better. I like what Paul said, nobody owes you anything post-retirement. Um, when you're a career person, understand that you're there to serve your boss. When you're a business person, understand that you're there to serve your customer, right? That's your boss. Your customer will basically be your boss. So what really happens is as long as the service is not being rendered, then you're of no use. And I don't think HR were originally hired to take care of us in retirement. We are just trying to inject this humanity thing of saying it is good practice for companies to take care of their employees post-retirement. But if this grandfather is not going to add any value to the bottom line, organizations are not going to pay attention to whatever it is that you're doing out there because you're not bringing value. So that connects to what I was saying about doing meaningful things. If you are actually trying to do meaningful things in your life outside of work, then you're going to find places to go and add value for yourself, you know, and connect with people on a different level. So because the HR won't be doing it, you have to think about it yourself. Plan all of this, you know, attending this, sharing this, passing this on to others. Let's be, even when we are like 100 people attending this call, 100, 110, 
pass this on to somebody else because that person may end up coming and sucking you dry. You know, there will be somebody who depends on you. So we should not be keeping some of this information to ourselves and it should be, as you're spreading it, you're also narrowing down to who do you need for your next space. Those, uh, the slide that Patrick had, had broken down the different age units very, very well. Who are you hanging out at every stage of your life? Now, when you get to 55 going to 70, as much as possible, try to do hard things. Try to do new things. Why? Because brain plasticity, we're talking about dementia, and this is not like a psychology meeting, but the brain grows. The brain is a muscle, and it grows every time you're having different experiences. So if you get yourself stuck in a routine and you're not doing anything new or learning stuff, then your brain is just going to stagnate and start declining because with age anyway, it will decline. So try as much as possible to be doing new things, experiencing new stuff, doing hard things when you can learn a different skill. But there's something else that is very, very key and it comes, it, it is connecting with the younger generation. There's something new to learn from those who are behind you. If you actually grow old and think that now you're done with life, okay, so I'm approaching retirement, I have nothing more to live for. There is so much to learn from the younger generation that can actually keep you fresh. There was some Chinese thing, uh, proverb that used to say, I'm going to paraphrase it, but I like the fact that it said that everybody needs a young person to learn from, an old person, a young and old person to learn from, and then also young people that you can teach and then peers to go through this journey with. Because with my peers, all I can say is even you, even me. But if somebody is older than me, they give me hope. If somebody is younger than me, they give me energy. So if we can actually avoid doing life alone and do it cross-generationally, then you will be able to have a healthy life as we go on. Uh, so what I'd like to say is we are in a user society where everybody likes approaching life with what's in it for me. And that's why we are getting to the place where once you get to retirement, you know that you didn't build relationships. Therefore, you have no use to anybody else. Why? Because you have surrounded yourself with people who think, what's in it for me? You have been thinking, what's in it for yourself? How about thinking about another person? So that when I'm looking forward to my retirement, what I'm doing is looking forward to the value I'm going to add as an old person in my society. What value am I going to add out of the things that I have learned? Um, if I made mistakes, I knew Patrick once upon a time. He may not remember, but we met, you know, those years that he's mentioning of earning high salaries, we are just about age mates, where there are lessons that we learned or we couldn't learn or mistakes that we made. What are you telling that 25-year-old person now when you're 50? Because if you are 50, 56, you're helping out that 25-year-old, when you're 70, they will come to you for advice when they're 50. You get so we are doing this human life connected with each other. In Kenya, we don't have as good homes as uh, we may have out there where Kinaposa are, but I think it would help if we actually built somebody who's looking for somewhere to invest, start investing in old people's homes. Why? Because we are growing up in a global space as we said, our children do not know that they need to be taken care of, the grown-ups. So if we actually would set up places where the old people will have wholesome life, then we are going to have, should I say, happier lives moving forward. And this is not just about enjoying. It's because I know happiness is one of the things that clears space in the mind to help you invest right, to help you listen to good advice, to help you take care of you know, the different connections that you need to have. And I know we did not talk, and Posa, sorry, I'm bringing this up, but I know we did not talk about addictions much as we were supposed to, but at the root of every addiction is pain. So we are finding the things that old people are getting addicted to are as a result of the pain they are going through. And it's like a self-medication sort of space where they're trying to deal with this new thing that has come, old age. So for HR, HR should not be running programs that only talk about retirement or investment or gym membership or whatever. I think I would like to challenge any HR who's listening to this to look at the humans that they deal with as full humans 
across the span of development. Because if you treat somebody well and they love your company, you know how once upon a time we had um, generations, families working in an organization. I feel as though even banks can do that. I feel as though um, I can run my organization in such a way that the children of my people, the children of my employees actually want to come and work with me. You get, so if we treated generations well as HR, we can be guaranteed to have a certain quality of staff. If you're not just thinking of them as cogs who come, you know, they come, they do their job and you churn them out and you wait for the next generation. This sort of engagement that I'm suggesting is going to solve our problem of having old people saying they can't leave the workspace because the millennials are not employable. If we look at ourselves as an interconnected human race, we are going to create the space where everybody benefits from whatever age and stage the other person is in. So I'd like to throw that challenge out to us. You know, even as you're investing, as you're taking care of your health, take care of yourself wholesomely as a result of such conversations. Thanks, Posa. Yes, we did not cover um, addictions because it's 11. I mean, it's yeah. 11, two hours, so yeah. But let's not start, but, yeah. Yeah, let's not, let's, that's a whole different story, but we need to, Charlotte, you know, you, you know you're my person, you come back. Um, <laughs> so um, um, thank you very much. Uh, is there any question the panelists would want to ask any other panelists? And if there's anything I didn't cover, um, apart from addiction, um, you 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 can speak now. And the people in the forum, we don't bite. You can actually raise your hand, and we will ask you to speak if you have a question. That's burning. Um, yeah, panelists, kuna kitu niliacha uko inje. Nafikiri nafikiri ile kitu naweza kusema posa. Okay, let's go back to <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> there's a Tanzanian amongst us, so he'll just be. I just want to yeah. say one thing that um, yeah. even as we talk about money uh, runs across all these things we talk about. Money provides for, but money is not everything. But it's just one thing I'd like to say that even as you plan, maybe Patrick is better uh, on this, but I just want to run that as make sure your money is at some point it's easily converted into cash you can easily access it in the form of cash because when you want, become vulnerable you may not have time to wait until you turn an asset into cash for one month for whatever thing so and that's why probably why some of us become so uh, proponents of, of retirement benefits that you 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 access your assets in there name of cash and therefore you are able to, to to deal with your issues as and when they come up okay thank you panelists mwingine tu kuna kitu inakuuma si kusema Okay, any questions amongst us or Sarah can close and then usually after this we have a very short... I was just going to mention something. Eh? Okay. Uh, what Okwemba has said is um, in a very layman language is uh, when you retire, a retired person needs money all the time that is flowing regularly. So from a, from a financial flow, and that's why you don't own the kind of assets that are designed to give you growth you own the kind of assets that are designed to give you cash flow um we say like a joke that in retirement you're either eating or in hospital so you need to be able to have cash quickly so but that is why the retirement fund itself the moment you pass retirement it goes into annuities that gives you money regularly that regularity is important uh, one because you are used to it so you are continuing to because um, you don't have the ability to wait for too long. Uh, usually some, some of these people, they have only themselves to, to depend on. And I think that's a key thing 
um, the doctor is not there, but let me say this. If you have not built a home, by the time you're retiring, build it near a road. You need accessibility to medical services quickly. So don't build the house too far away from the road. One, because you can't walk long distance, and sometimes you will not have the benefit of, of, of you having the money all the time to take you where you should go. Um, like we said earlier, the poverty issues around retirees are real in this, this country. Again, try to play safe when the fund you have in your hand is small. If you have to learn doing something new, you use a little money and a lot of time so that you go through the learning curve first. If it works, you bring in more money. Otherwise, stay safe. Okay, there's an anonymous question. How do I make friends? I find myself unable to connect with people. This is a shalom question, right? I want to I want to borrow from something we were having a conversation about, I think yesterday or the day before, about the way young people are doing it. Um, if you actually, when you when you find it difficult to make friends, a lot of the time you'll find it's because you have you you probably have this pressure of thinking that you need to be friends with many people. When we talk about friends, we we almost feel the pressure of knowing and being known and hanging out with very many people. The idea is to actually have that one person you can call a friend. So for somebody who struggles with uh, choosing friends, pick one at a time. And how do you pick them? Pick something that matters to you and just give somebody either a call, reach out to them and say, hi, I like how you do ABCD. Could we meet for a cup of coffee? Right, and this is, I'm saying this because this is in an adult sort of setting. Young people are being able to reach out to each other on Instagram and such like places and saying, hey, I like your style. I like this. I like where you get your clothes from. You know, come, can you come and help me? Let's try and borrow that also for us as adults. Just call somebody. I reach out to Posa and I say, I mean, Posa, Sharon and I now end up talking directly because I just reached out to her and told her, hey, I like what you're doing about this and this. Can I get to know you better? And just that one at a time. Then understand that you don't make a friend within the first few. Trust takes time and it takes time to build a relationship with somebody who you're going to call a friend. So don't be under pressure to meet people and then expect that automatically they become friends. Just get this person to be an acquaintance because then you have to open up little by little to know how much of yourself can you eventually give you know, out to them as a friendship. So I'd say, let's not be under pressure to make friends as much as to make meaningful friendships and meaningful relationships. Then again, like I said, in adulthood, when you choose a friend, they don't have to be your handbag. They don't have to be this person that you hang out with for everything. You can have friends in different spheres of life. So then you're basically uh, ensuring that you're socializing across your different arenas, as opposed to thinking that you're only looking for those people who are going to know everything about you. Let's leave God to be the one to know everything about you. And then for human beings, just start slowly. Start different sections of your life at a time. If you start at 40, by 70, you will have figured out who you want to be in your life longer, longer in terms of time and longer in terms of even headspace. So start small. Pick one at a time based on the different spaces that you're at and build it from there. No pressure. Mm. Okay, thank you. I saw Funga Kitu at Wakakules on both sides. We branch where we to a home dinner. Hey, uh, you know, it's bad when the person who insists on English of the nose is uh, <laughs> throwing in Swahili in. So, Thank you, thank you, thank you, um, everyone. Um, today's um, attendance just testifies to the um, heaviness or the necessity of the topic. And um, <laughs> so we've been listening to it um, off, this, off the camera. My wife has been listening to it. And yeah, this one has hit very close to home. It's very sobering seeing the charts and realizing, wait, well, what's our age again? How far is retirement? 
which bank are we raiding next time? But thank you for it's it's important. Better the bruises of a friend than the kisses of an enemy. And I I believe both, I mean, from all the angles, the psychological angle, the financial angle, the human resource angle, the health angle, we've been able to get nice bruising from a friend, from the friends. And this will protect us so that if he who has an ear has been able to hear. So thank you, each of our panelists, for making time and for sharing with depth and liberality the sum totality of your wisdom and insights. And I am sure they are a blessing to many others. I want to iterate something that has been said. Um, the advice that has been given here may need to be customized to people individually. So our panelists have been very generous to donate two hours of their time. Um, and we do recognize that some of you may need to sit down with them for more customized time. We are asking that you begin embracing the culture of paying so that you don't reach out for another freebie. You, you've experienced two hours of a freebie. Asking for more than that is disrespect to people's craft. So I'm sure they are all available and all willing to check on your financial health, your mental health, your physical health um, to make sure you're well set up. They will share their contacts and we will be um, able to share it alongside this video. So please do reach out to them. Um, that being said, panelists, when we call on you again, please show up um, for free. <laughs> yeah. I really need to thank Nzula and my friend Evelyn Machogu. Um, you, you, uh, for, for you who don't know the backs and edges, the, 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 my request is simple. Just bring someone who can talk off the cuff because most people most are used people. to I, I used to uh, PowerPoint. I just asked for off the cuff and we can gel. And they always deliver from Robina, Paul. Paul changed his flight to be on this um, uh, on this call. Thank you. Patrick, I saw you on Atara Solutions and I was like, and Zula, I want Shalom. You know where we got you from. Um, I, I always thank Chakua for bringing you on. Because I, I inter interfered. Continue. Thanks for the fleshing out. Um, our next topic is going to happen a few weeks from now, the first week of July. At now is a scheduled time. We're going to share a new thing, a, a word that I had a new word. It's called sh sh sharenting. Um, th this whole business of um, parents posting their children, um, you know, on all social media um, platforms. Um, what's the psychology behind that? What's a is it healthy? What is a short-term, long-term effect on both the parent and on the child? So it's a, regardless of how you feel, I think it's an important topic because it gives a window into many more important things. So the same avenues you get the post and the awareness, you will be able to get the link for this. Um, please follow us on all our social media handles, all of them. Um, on Facebook, we are on Authentic Dialogues with Sarah Jackson. On Instagram, it is one Sarah Jackson. On YouTube, we have two channels. One where specifically for these particular sessions, it's called Authentic Dialogue. So just look for it and share, like, and subscribe. And also there is a second YouTube channel just called Sarah Jackson that has a lot more other content related on the subject matter of identity and transition. Um, on TikTok, there's a burgeoning TikTok also one side Jackson. Um, thank you again. And please also share topics, um, concerns, ideas that you would like to be addressed. And when panelists. Yes, and panelists you'd like to hear from. Thank you for, for that. And when I'm done with this, we usually will keep for very few minutes for the people who are on the Zoom to have a chance to ask questions that they do not want to be broadcast. Again, that's one benefit of joining us live on the Zoom. So once again, thank you everyone and the good Lord bless you and make you abound. Prepare well for the four horsemen of retirement and also help you support those and understand those who are going through the four horsemen of retirement. Until next time, stay authentic.